as he said, hello, you all. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, I think most of you out here already are or want to be a successful entrepreneur. And I will make some suggestions. The first thing you have to do is retrain your brain. I know that sounds crazy, but you know when you were pre-kindergarten, you were extremely creative. Then you got into our public schools. Let me tell you one. And I can say this because you know I've taught chemistry and physics and biology at age 25. I was high school principal, so I got an education background. I know what goes on there. And the real problem with our educational system, stop and think what it was designed for. It was designed to get the farmer out of the field to start working on the assembly line, to follow the rules, to do what you're told, don't change anything. But the problem is our assembly lines are either gone overseas or they've been replaced with innovation. So that, that model doesn't work anymore, but yet most of our public schools still follow that model, okay? So when I say you gotta retrain your brain, here's what I want you to think about. You gotta understand what your brain is. Most of you have no clue how smart you are. And I don't mean you think you're not smart enough or you think you're too smart. Here's what I mean by that. You think your SAT and your ACT determines how smart you are. That is an extremely good measuring system to see how successful you will be in upper level school. That's what it's designed for. The problem is it only measures 40 or 50 things your brain does. I hate to tell you this, but your brain does more than 10,000 things. Remember your brain is not just only your thinking, but it's all your muscles, your organs, everything your body does. Your brain does a lot of things. We're only measuring 40, 50. We don't have any way of measuring what those 10,000 things do. So I want you to try to understand your brain like this. Remember when you were a kid, you had these little toy blocks, A, B, C. Now imagine you've got three piles of them. A pile of great big toy blocks, a middle-sized pile, and a, small, a, little, a pile of little blocks, okay? Now imagine you take 10,000 little scrap pieces of paper and you write on them. You can't do this, but imagine you could. On these 10,000 pieces of paper, you write on there what your brain can do. And you glue them at random on all those blocks. Mix them all up and you put them in your brain. Well, guess what? That's everybody out here. You have big blocks, you have middle-sized blocks, and you have little blocks, meaning there's some things you do very well, some things you don't do very well. Now you just heard him say, I've got 50 some pounds. That's true. So all of you immediately assume I'm smart. Well, guess what? Well, I got a head full of little blocks just like you do. I'll give you some examples. My handwriting is so bad, and that's controlled by your brain, I had to teach myself to print so I can read my notes in college. <laughs> My spelling is so bad, 50% of the time, spell check can't even figure out what I'm trying to spell. <laughs> and when I meet somebody, I am so bad at remembering people's faces and names, I don't say, glad to meet you, I say, glad to see you. Because I've been embarrassed when I, someone says, I say, I'm glad to meet you, you said, well, we just met last month. <laughs> so I've made compensations for my little blocks, but I've also figured out what my good blocks are, my big blocks. I have this uncanny ability to build three-dimensional things in my head, laying in bed at night, in color. I can change any part on a mechanical component, change the colors, make it move around. It just happens to be one of my big blocks. So. You really got to figure out what your big blocks are. Next step, once you figure out what your big blocks are, and the best way to describe and find out what your own big blocks are, is what are you good at, but more importantly, what do you like? Those are usually your big blocks, big blocks. And your little blocks are usually 
what you don't like. So identify your big blocks. Now, try to find a niche. And the key to this is the niche. You can't compete with the big, huge corporations, the big box stores. You can't compete in that world. You've got to find a little niche. And you've got to find a niche where someone needs what you can do well. And if you put those together, whether it's getting a job or finding a company, that is where it meshes, and that is where you develop a passion. If you can find someone that needs what you can do well, you don't have to decide whether you like it or not. You just develop a passion. And I've been doing research for five years on a book, A Space on Evolution. It'll be titled, The Need to be Needed. We are genetically hardwired to be needed, and that's a whole other conversation. But just trust me, you are, everybody here is hardwired to be needed. It controls two things totally. It controls your happiness, it controls your immune system. Stop and think about that. Your happiness controls your immune system. You take someone who retires with nothing to do, ask any family doctor. Two years later, they'll die. The immune system is controlled by it. But you look at people that don't feel needed, for whatever reason, they aren't happy. I learned this by living for five weeks in five remote villages in southwest China, the hardest part of the world. Living in the villages, living in the people's home, eating their food. It dawned on me, why are as many people happy here, percentage-wise, as my rich friends back home? It's obviously not material goods, it's not money. If you perceive you're happy, you will be, you know, if you feel perceive you're needed, you will feel happy. It's just hardwired in us, and I can go into why we evolved that way, but that is the animal we are. Well, I will go on to what makes a successful entrepreneur. Number one, after you find the niche, you find someone that needs you, is selling. Don't think of selling like you think of selling at all. To me, the worst salesman in the world, when you go to buy a car and they try to talk you into what they think you need, and that's, to me, not selling. But when you have a business, in fact, not just when you have a business, your whole life, all you do is sell. What do you do when you have a business? You're selling, you know you're selling the customers, not only that, you're selling your employees. You're selling your banker. You're selling your suppliers. You spend all day selling. But selling is not as you perceive selling. The way I like to sell is by asking questions and teaching. That's the two keys. I ask questions and I teach. Okay? I'm not a fast talking seller. I go to a trade show, I can't stand up front and talk someone in coming in and buying something. I usually have some of the people that work for me do that. And once I get them in, I can ask them questions, I can find out what their needs are, I know what I'm selling, I know if I can meet that need, and if I can, I let them know. But I do it by asking questions and I let them I let be in their brain what, if I'm selling a scat ride, for example, I don't tell them they need to buy a scat. I ask them questions, and it's their decision to buy a scat, not mine telling them. If you do that, it sticks in their brain, they keep the scat. If I, I can talk them into it, but if I do, tomorrow they might change their mind. So that's the first thing I do. But getting them asking questions, getting them involved, makes all the difference. It makes it so easy to sell because my background is teaching. So what I'm only doing is teaching them about my product. And the other thing I do that is critically important, and I found this is the best thing ever to build long-term relationships. I'll give you an example. I was trying to sell a ride called a sket. And I'm talking to this car, and he was literally ready to buy the sket. And I said, that's not what you want to buy. He looked at me like I was crazy. I said, why? He said, why? I said, because you have a roundup 
and my scat will compete with it, and it will take some of the money away from your Roundup, and your Roundup will take some money away from me, from the scat. And he says, oh, I never thought about that. So I don't recommend you buy the scat. There's a company out in Colorado builds a rise that would fit perfectly on your midway. Guess what? The next 10 years, every time he wanted to buy a ride, he called me and said, what do you think I need? <laughs> but you build up trust, because if your customers don't feel warm and fuzzy about you, it just doesn't work. Another thing I want to point out, don't be afraid to fail. This is the only way you learn. One of the things I'll, you'll love is whenever I hire people, the very last thing I'd say to them, and they look at me like I am crazy, I say one way you can get fired around here real quick, quick is not make a mistake. And they think, I have literally lost my mind. I said, no, let me explain. I hire you because you've got experience, you've got some education, maybe more importantly, you've got a fire in your belly. Okay? I want you to use that. And I want you to push this company to improve it. And if you do all those things, you're going to be out there trying what you know how to do very well. And you are going to make some mistakes. And I don't expect the same stupid mistakes over and over. And I do expect you to make common sense. When you make mistakes, I will back you. Okay? I've had more employees come to me like six months later, a year later, say, you just have no idea how much nicer it is to work where we can go out and really do what we think this company needs and we can really express ourselves and that you put that kind of trust in us. And it just makes it a much more wonderful place to work. And I can tell you this creates more employee loyalty than you can believe. Make sure, though, that all the mistakes are made, you learn from it. And I have always had a rule, and this has really helped me a lot, because I've made lots and lots of mistakes. Whenever I make a mistake, I don't try to correct the mistake. I try to figure out how to make the mistake turn out something better. And usually you can. It just takes a little of that creative, using some of those blocks that the public schools didn't try to block. With all that said, I'm going to add one more thing. Never, ever, ever give up. Thank you.